When Kiera Hudson married Adam Benefield, she never imagined that her life would turn into a living nightmare, and that the very man who vowed to love and protect her would be the same that ends up taking her life. She just bought a blue blue vest two days ago, posted it on Facebook. The Buffalo mother is dead, and there is currently a manhunt underway for the person of interest in her killing. But the saddest thing is that there were a lot of red flags that had gone ignored. Kiara had tried desperately to get help, even posting a graphic video on Facebook showing her monster of a husband attacking her. Yet the police didn't do anything. This is a horrific crime uh, allegedly committed in front of three children. But how did things get this bad? And why didn't anyone do anything to save Kiara? Let's explore the devastating case of Kiara Hudson. She was killed after exposing her abusive husband. She said if anything ever happens to her, she will not rest in peace. In February 2022, 30-year-old Kiara Hudson got married to 45-year-old Adam Benfield, and she took to Facebook to say that it was the happiest day of her life. This really was the best day of my life. I never felt more beautiful, special, loved. I got a lifetime friend partner who loves me with every breath he has, gave me a beautiful dream wedding. I love you, Adam, forever. The very soon after the wedding, Kiara realized that Adam was not the knight in shining armor that he had portrayed himself to be. He was in fact a cowardly monster who had no qualms about physically abusing her and her children. You see, Adam was known to have a bad temper and had a history of violence even before the two got married. Kiara's family had even tried to warn her against marrying him, but Kiara, who was described as sweet and loving, thought that Adam would actually change. Unfortunately, he never did. Instead, he only got worse after the marriage. On September 28, 2022, Adam threatened Kiara with a knife, severely beat her up, took her phone to prevent her from calling for help, and confined her to the house. Then, as she bled on the floor, he took pictures of her in that battered state. How sick is that? The Chictawaga police would later respond to a 911 call from Kiara's residence, which was in Chictawaga, New York. Kiara described the horrific details of the attack to the police, saying that she came home after a friend's birthday party and confronted Adam after learning that he had whooped her daughter and then left her alone outside their home. On searching the house, the police found Adam in a bathroom where he had locked himself up and was self-harming with a box cutter. Due to the condition he was in, Adam was taken to the hospital before being charged with harassment. The charges were not upgraded until Kiara showed the police a chilling surveillance video showing Adam attacking her. She would also go on to post the same disturbing video on Facebook, where Adam can be seen hitting and punching her as she lay helpless on the floor. She captioned the video, This is what this man does to me, but I'm always treated like I'm the abuser. On that same day, she would later post saying, Don't underestimate me. I'm a Hudson. We were born strong, but I also know when to play weak, and it saved my life. I was smart enough to get myself out of that situation alive. It was after this incident that Kiara made the bold decision to leave the house she shared with Adam and went to live with her mother. Now, I wish I could say that this was the end story and that Kiara finally got out of the abusive situation. Sadly, that was far from what happened. Adam could not let Kiara go like that. He started stalking her, harassing her, and even threatened to end her life. This was just too much for Kiara and she got an order of protection against him, but that didn't seem to stop him. Kiara got so desperate that she even started wearing a bulletproof vest to protect herself. You can imagine how scared she had to have been to get to this point. She just bought a bulletproof vest two days ago, posted it on Facebook. On October 4th, 2022, Adam was arraigned in court on several misdemeanor charges, including third degree assault, fourth degree criminal mischief, second degree menacing, and second degree unlawful imprisonment. That same day, he was let go without bail. Apparently, under New York's laws, bail is not required to be set for most misdemeanor charges, even if they're violent. This law was passed in 2019 to ensure that a person wouldn't have to stay in jail if they could afford to pay for release. New York State is the last state that doesn't take into account the dangerousness of a defendant to the community when considering bail. That is something that we've asked for. That is something that we will continue to ask for, and we hope that our elected officials consider those changes. Ugh. 
just when you're happy for Kiara, this happens. Anyway, Adam was ordered to stay away from Kiara. He was also expected to be back at Chiktagawa Town Court on October 5th for further proceedings, but he was a no-show for reasons you'll soon find out. So, after the horrific attack, some domestic violence advocates had found safe housing for Kiara, but she turned it down and chose to stay with her mother. The police would later say that she had assured them that she would be okay there, so they left her there without any protection. This really frustrated Kiara, and she went on Facebook to let out her frustrations. I swear, the cops aren't worth anything. This is crazy. They need a dead body before they help. I'm calling and begging them to help me. They are useless. Kiara's sister, Montesha Jeter, said Kiara had tried everything to get the police to help her. She's just been trying to get help. I've been with her, going to police stations. She's been texting me, sending me videos, giving me her phone password just in case. And she took a picture in it last night and said, if this isn't a cry for help, I don't know what is. Buffalo Police Department. On Wednesday morning, October 5th, 2022. Kiara woke up and donned her bulletproof vest to take her kids to school. My mom asked her, why are you putting that vest on? She said, because mom, he's going to kill me. You don't understand. Sadly, that was exactly what happened. At around 8.30 a.m., Kiara was sitting in her SUV with her children strapped in the back. As she turned around a corner, a car came from nowhere and rammed into hers. Then Adam got out of the car with a gun and fired at Kiara on the face before driving off. Kiara was declared dead at the scene. The police still need your help tracking down this man. Adam Benefield is a person of interest in yesterday morning's deadly shooting on Richland Avenue. Now that's where police say Kiara Hudson, Benefield's wife, was shot and killed sitting in her car with her three kids. A massive manhunt was immediately launched for Adam, with the police offering a reward to anyone with information about his whereabouts. Shoppers is offering a $7,500 reward for anyone with information on his whereabouts at this time. However, they are warning the public do not approach Benefield. If you see him, he is considered dangerous. The news of what happened to Kiara left her family and friends completely devastated. The community was also shocked and horrified that someone would be so callous and sick as to do something so awful in front of young children. This is a horrific crime uh, allegedly committed in front of three children. Kiara's ex-boyfriend, Andrew Hodge, who was also the father of one of her kids, did an interview on TV talking about the trauma that the children would have to live with after witnessing their mom being taken out in front of them. I know he was arrested a couple of days ago for domestic violence. I think your daughter was in that car. Yes, she was. She saw what happened? Yes, she did. And there was two other kids in the car, a newborn and a five-year-old. Andrew said that Kiara was trying everything to keep her family and children safe. When the video was posted on Facebook, everyone saw it. Everybody was trying to help her and this is what happens. After being on the run for several days, Buffalo police received a tip about his whereabouts, and he was arrested on October 12th, 2022. Benefield was arraigned today on charges of second degree murder, three counts of endangering the welfare of a child, and aggravated criminal contempt. He pleaded not guilty to the charges and was held without bail to await his trial. Benefield was held in custody and a grand jury formed. If convicted of all charges, Benefield faced a maximum of life in prison. Kiara's murder sparked widespread outrage since it happened after Adam was released by a judge, even when he proved to be a danger to Kiara. It made matters worse when it was revealed that this was not even the first time he had done something like this. In 2000, he reportedly stole a car and slammed it into his ex-girlfriend's car before kidnapping her and her passenger at gunpoint and engaging the police in a high-speed chase. He was 22 years old at the time, and while he was awaiting trial on September 16, 2000, he reportedly escaped from the correctional facility by climbing over a 15-foot wall and through razor wire. He was, however, captured 19 hours later and charged with two counts of second-degree kidnapping and one count of first-degree escape. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. I have problems and they, they just don't want to help. They, they ignore all my requests. They start ignoring me at the jail. With such a violent criminal history, 
people were outraged that he was still set free to go carry out his attack on Kiara. Kiara's family blamed the county government and bail reform for what happened to their loved one, but the governor defended the state's bail reform law and insisted that it was the criminal justice system that failed Kiara. Orders of protection have to be granted, transition homes have to be available, and we have to make sure that judges and prosecutors charge appropriately. Adam had only been charged with misdemeanors, and therefore the judge had no right to hold him. Despite the fact that there was a video showing Adam brutally attacking Kiara, the prosecution insisted that there was no evidence to charge him with anything higher than a misdemeanor. The officers who had responded to Kiara's home after the attack on September 28th also reported that she had no obvious injuries apart from a bruised wrist. So that is a tragic situation, but we did make changes to the bail laws. I'm always open to more conversations based on the data. It's only been in effect a uh, fairly short time, but we're also focusing on gun violence overall. Sadly, Kiara's three children are now without a mother or father just because a coward who cannot control his temper had a gun and used it. The children were taken in by Kiara's family, where they are safe. A GoFundMe was created by Kiara's family to support the three kids. Hopefully, they'll be okay and will overcome the trauma of witnessing their mother's death. Domestic violence is always heartbreaking. Lives are lost, homes broken, and children are left without parents. It's worse when the system could have prevented such a situation from happening, but failed to do so. And it's especially frustrating because the government knows these things are happening, but does very little to stop them. What do you think? Did the system fail Kiara? Could her death have been prevented? I know what happened. I needed me to know, figure it out what happened. If you don't have me, you don't know what happened. Looking I just cool. know that some guy come here. Yeah. And he f up some guy. What I happened then? Tell me what happened. This city is mine. I'm not gonna This city is yours, is it? Yeah, this city is mine. The first rule of thumb in every criminal activity is to evade capture at all costs. Most criminals tend to keep a low profile, so it stands out when a criminal not only returns to his scene of crime, but taunts the police, proudly bragging that he was the key to solving the case. After all, providing such information is like leading the police right to you. But that's exactly what Merrick Hecko did. This is a tale of obsession, jealousy, and hatred. Welcome to Crime City. This is the story of Merrick Hecko, the murderer who got drunk and confessed to cops at the crime scene. In the early hours of July 25th, 2022, cops were called to a brutal crime scene. And as they were working to assess the situation, a man walked up to one of the guarding officers with a bottle of brandy in his hand. The man appeared drunk and was ranting about many things, but amid his sometimes incoherent rants, he said something that caught the officer's attention. He said he knew someone had attacked a man in the house. The officer was shocked. They had just been called to the crime scene and no one knew the details of what had gone on in the house, yet. As much as the detail was suspicious to the officer, she couldn't rule out that this could be the rantings of a drunk. When the man wouldn't leave the scene and kept insisting that they needed him to solve the case, the officers at the scene placed him under arrest for drunk and disorderly conduct and went back to their investigation. You're gonna think about me, but it's not gonna be me because there's no proof. Marek Heko was a 23-year-old Slovakian citizen who moved to the United Kingdom in 2019. He wanted a fresh start and was captivated by the city of Chelmsford, where he settled. It was about 30 miles northeast of London. While its proximity to London was promising, it was its sprawling countryside and happy people that truly held Merrick's heart. Merrick wanted to be a chef. He knew it wasn't going to be easy to start his career in a new place, but he was willing to put in the hours until he could live his dream of sharing delicious cuisine from his hometown with the world. He started as a waiter in two different restaurants, and with time, Merrick got employed as a chef, Finally, he could do what he had always wanted to do. There seemed to be no stopping him now, or so he thought. By 2021, Merrick was doing well in Chelmsford. He had a secure job with a stable income and was building a bright future for himself. His personal life also wasn't lacking. Merrick had met a girl named Stephanie Bream. She worked at a local bar in Chelmsford. Merrick was completely in love with Stephanie. He loved spending time with her and always wanted to be around her. Everything seemed to be going well at first, but at some point, Merrick and Stephanie's journey took a very dark turn. That point came when Stephanie started noticing something off about Merrick. He would lie to her about his whereabouts, and when she confronted him with it, he spun more lies. At first, Stephanie thought he was cheating. She would soon find out something worse. Merrick was a junkie. 
She confronted him about it, but he denied it. Even though Merrick kept denying it, Stephanie couldn't shake the feeling that he was using substances. Eventually, the signs were too hard to ignore. Merrick was constantly high, and Stephanie had had enough of his lies and deceit. By April 2022, Stephanie had ended things with Merrick, telling him she couldn't be with a junkie. At first, Merrick seemed to accept the breakup, but as time went on, he seemed to struggle with letting Stephanie go. He would call her repeatedly, sending her long texts begging her to give him a second chance. The more Stephanie turned him down, the more erratic Merrick became. He would randomly turn up at her house or work, begging her to take him back. And when none of that was working, Merrick lied to her that he had colon cancer, hoping it would bring her back to him. That plan failed, but that didn't stop Merrick. He continued to bombard Stephanie with messages, and no matter how many times she turned him away, Merrick didn't seem to understand Stephanie would never take him back. When begging Stephanie didn't work, Merrick graduated to stalking her. He would obsess over her Facebook page, confident the reason Stephanie wasn't taking him back was because there was someone else in her life. He would stalk posts she liked and commented on, and people she friended. He would scrutinize every little interaction she had on Facebook. Merrick had no idea how right he was about Stephanie, and when he found out, it would set in motion horrific events that cost a wife her husband and two children their father. Stephanie was seeing someone new. She had started a relationship with a man named Adrian Ellenford a little while after ending things with Merrick. Adrian was a 44-year-old man who lived in Chelmsford. People who knew him described him as a hardworking man who cared a great deal about his family and was always willing to lend a helping hand to anyone who needed it. He had two kids, boys, aged 10 and 12. Adrian was a model resident of Chelmsford, volunteering at the local Boy Scout group whenever he had the time. But as committed of a husband and father as he was, Adrian was not perfect. He had a terrible secret he was hiding from his family, a secret they wouldn't find out until it was too late. Although he had a wife whom he had been with for 17 years, Adrian also had a mistress. He had been secretly sneaking around with Stephanie Bream for a while now. Although Stephanie and Adrian enjoyed spending time with each other, they were both desperate to keep things hush-hush. So when Merrick turned up at Stephanie's house at the same time Adrian was supposed to show up, Stephanie got a little nervous. Merrick went to Stephanie's house under the pretense that he was there to pick up some things he had left behind when they were still together. Stephanie quickly went through the house to get Merrick's things and gave them to him expecting him to leave afterward. Except Merrick wasn't budging. He stood outside the door for a good 40 minutes, begging her to take him back. As he was declaring his undying love for Stephanie, Adrian showed up. Adrian parked his car and went into the house, completely ignoring Merrick. But Merrick noticed him and asked Stephanie who he was. Stephanie refused to answer Merrick's question and asked him to leave. Merrick had a sneaking suspicion the man in the house was there to see Stephanie. But because Stephanie lived with her mom, he couldn't be sure the man wasn't there to see her mom. So he left things alone, for the moment. Merrick eventually got tired of begging Stephanie and left her house, but he couldn't shake off the feeling that he had lost Stephanie to the man in the house. On July 24th, 2022, Stephanie, Adrian, and Stephanie's mom stepped out for a bit of fun. They visited the local pub for some drinks, then headed back home to hang out. After hanging out for some time, Stephanie and Adrian went to bed around 1 a.m. Stephanie's bedroom was located on the first floor of the house, while her mom's bedroom was on the ground floor. Stephanie probably fell asleep at around 2.43 a.m., as cell phone records show that was the last time she checked her phone. Around 4.30 a.m., Stephanie woke up to the sounds of the sheets rustling. She opened her eyes and saw Adrian trying to get out of bed. What he said was both shocking and confusing to the still groggy Stephanie. Someone has been in here, Adrian calmly whispered. Stephanie asked what he meant, and he once again told her he thought someone had just been in the room. As he was making his way to her side of the bed, Adrian collapsed face first on the floor. Stephanie was suddenly wide awake. She screamed at Adrian to get up, but there was no response. She rushed to his side to figure out what happened to him when she saw some blood on him. Suddenly, what Adrian had been trying to whisper made sense. Stephanie screamed for her mom and immediately started dialing 999. Her mom rushed in to help as Stephanie explained the bizarre situation to the police. Stephanie tried her best to describe what happened to the police on the phone, but as she was still confused, she couldn't provide them with enough details. The police were on their way. Stephanie hung up the phone, still shocked and confused. But as she clutched Adrian's now limp body tightly in her arms, the pieces were beginning to come together in her head. Adrian had been viciously attacked. He had been stabbed twice 
each blow so vicious that the blade struck a bone in Adrian's chest and the handle broke off. Stephanie became hysterical, screaming and shouting. She eventually had to be led from the room before she quieted down. By the time emergency services got to Stephanie's house, Adrian was dead. The police immediately cordoned off the crime scene to collect evidence. A few things were immediately obvious. There had been no sign of forced entry, and the front door was left wide open. Stephanie told the police she was in the habit of leaving her sliding door slightly open to let some breeze in during the summer heat. The police surmised that the killer had come in through the sliding door and left through the front door. Upon further search through the house, the police found a knife handle at the bottom of the stairs and an empty wine bottle on the side of the house. This case was curious. Who would come in the middle of the night to stab one person in a house that had three people in it, not steal anything, and why? But the police wouldn't be left wondering for long. They worked well into the morning, and as daybreak came, so did an unexpected visitor, bearing a harrowing confession. At around 7.30 a.m., Merrick Hecko sauntered onto the crime scene, a bottle of brandy in hand, and a confession on his lips. Who are you looking for? Uh, I'm looking for a I can help her. What's going on? Uniform one night? Yeah, I can help her. What's going on? Yeah. No, I know what happened. I know the people they involved. So. Go again. Yeah. But need to dig deep, you know? Thank you. What's your name? I'm not going to tell you my name. I don't give a f Because I know what happened. I needed me to know, figure it out, what happened. If you don't have me, you don't know what happened. Merrick continued to taunt the officer. Looking I just know her. that some guy come here. Yeah. And he f up some guy. I don't know what, what happened. Right. I don't know what happened. He just got you're gonna think about me, but it's not gonna be me because there's no proof. So, so you think something's happened to a male in this address? No, I know what happened. What I happened then? Everything. Tell I me what happened. It. This city is mine. I'm not gonna This city is yours, is it? Yeah, this city is mine. At around 7.40 a.m. on July 25th, 2022, the police placed Merrick Hecko under arrest. In the van, please. You've been arrested, okay? We're trying I've to been arrested, yes. We're trying so to, me the we're law. Trying not, okay, we're trying me. not to manhandle you, but we need you to get in the van. At first, for drunk and disorderly conduct, but before the end of the day, Merrick had been charged with the murder of Adrian Ellingford. Merrick Hecko was charged to court, and in February 2023, his trial began. During his trial, the state tried to prove their case. They explained Merrick's obsession with Stephanie to the jury. They said he couldn't move on after the breakup and resulted to stalking her. They further explained that after realizing she had moved on from him, Merrick couldn't take it, so he lashed out, killing Adrian Ellingford. The prosecutors presented evidence to support their case. They showed the jury CCT footage of July 25, 2022. There Merrick was at 3.37 a.m., purchasing two bottles of red wine from a store on Rainsford Road in Chelmsford. The CCTV also shows him walking in the direction of Nelson Grove, where Stephanie and her mom lived. At 4.45 a.m., right after the vicious attack on Adrian, the CCTV captured Merrick again, walking away from Stephanie's home. But this time, there was only one bottle of wine in his hands. The prosecutors claimed Merrick went to Stephanie's home, drank one bottle of wine on the side of her house, and then left it there. They knew this because his DNA had been found on the bottle. Prosecutors also claimed that after Merrick drank the bottle of wine, he made his way into the house through the open sliding door, and once he saw Adrian in bed with Stephanie, he lost his mind and viciously attacked him. He stabbed him twice in the back before running out of the house through the front door, dropping the handle of the knife at the bottom of the stairs. His DNA was also found on the knife handle. Merrick denied the prosecutor's claims. He insisted his DNA was only on the bottle of wine in the knife handle because he had been in the house several times and his DNA was transferred to the items. He also claimed he returned to the scene because he had heard what happened on the news and wanted to help. But Merrick was forgetting one thing. By the time he arrived on the scene, no information had been released to the public, so it was impossible that he would have heard anything on the news. The jig was up. After deliberating for less than a day, the jury at the Chelmsford Crown Court found Merrick Hecko guilty of the murder of Adrian Ellingford. He was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole after a minimum of 26 years served. Stephanie was relieved justice had been served, and so was Adrian's wife. She read out a heartbreaking impact statement before sentencing. She said, 
Adrian was my amazing husband of 17 years, as well as being my husband. He was a loving son, a caring brother, a friend to many, and most importantly, a truly brilliant father to our boys. They will not have Adrian with them through the milestones in their lives. He will never be able to teach them to drive, buy them their first drink, or celebrate their academic achievements. He will never see them grow into young men who will have partners and families of their own. No one will ever be able to replace their dad. Adrian, you will always be missed by us as your family, and you will always hold a special place in our hearts. We miss you every day and love you forever. Hey, thanks for watching. What do you think about this case? Did Merrick's drug use play a role in why he murdered Adrian? Leave us a comment and remember to like and subscribe. He earlier bought items such as knives, rubbish bags, and cleaning products. Daniel Sancho Branchalo tried to cover up the crime by laying about where he stayed. He double booked his accommodation and had it all planned. This is Daniel Sancho Branchalo, a 29-year-old chef who lives in Madrid, Spain. On July 31st, 2023, he and his boyfriend, 44-year-old Edwin Arrieta Artiga from Colombia, arrived in Copacabana, where they had planned to stay till August 4th. But by August 1st, 2023, Daniel had bludgeoned Edwin to death, dismembered his body, thrown his head in the ocean, and gone out to party with his two side lovers. What makes this especially gruesome? And what led him to take this horribly dark path? Welcome to Crime City. This is the full story of Daniel Sancho Bronchalo the man who dismembered his lover and threw his head in the ocean. This story begins with body parts discovered in a garbage dump. Trash collectors in Copangyang are used to seeing all sorts of weird things disposed of. In fact, they had seen so many strange things while picking up trash at garbage dumps that they had built resistance against them. They couldn't be phased by anything anymore, or so they thought. Nothing in their years of picking up trash will prepare them for the grisly sight they were about to witness. August 3rd, 2023 began as usual for the trash collectors that worked at Mu 4 of Copanyan Municipal District. They had gotten their truck ready and headed their merry way to their location, whistling happy tunes and trading garbage shooks. They got to the dump at Mu 4 and alighted from their trucks and immediately started picking up trash. After they had loaded enough trash into their trucks, they headed to other locations on their route. Among the trash they picked up was a peculiar green fertilizer bag. The trash collectors were completely clueless as to what was inside, but they soon found out. By 12.30 p.m. on August 3rd, the trash collectors were unloading the truck when they picked up a fertilizer sack that was heavy. No, they were used to picking up heavy trash bags at dumps, but this was unusually heavy, and the smell was rancid. Something didn't seem right about that bag, so they decided to do something they'd never done. They decided to open up the fertilizer bag. As they placed the bag down to open up, the smell coming from the bag got even worse, even to the point of almost discouraging them to open it, but they had to find out. When they opened the bag, what they saw would haunt their dreams for years to come. They were confronted with a sawed-off pelvis, and chills immediately went down their spine. But that wasn't all. They would see something else, something even more disturbing. In the fertilizer sack, nestled underneath the pelvis, the trash collectors would discover intestines. The intestines, when weighed, came up to five kilograms. The trash collectors were horrified, and they knew they had to alert the police. When they arrived at the police station, they were immediately confronted with questions. Where was the rest of the body? Was it just one body? Where had they found the fertilizer bag? They had no response for the police because they had visited a lot of dump sites that day and didn't know where exactly they had picked up the bag, nor did they find any other body parts. The police knew they had their work cut out for them. If one body part was found, surely others were there or close by. So they retraced the steps of the trash collection to find the rest of the body parts. The police, along with forensic officers and medical staff from Copanyang Hospital, headed out in search of the rest of the body. They had searched a number of dump sites along the trash collector's route, but had come up empty. Their last location was Mu 4. If they didn't find them there, they might not be able to crack the case. But as luck, or whatever else you might call it, will have it, Mu 4 was the location they had been searching for. After hours of sifting through trash, they hit the jackpot. In a black trash bag, the police found two legs. There was something else. In the same bag was a black t-shirt, a pair of shorts, and a pair of red boxer shorts. 
the police were confused. Did the clothes belong to the victim or did they belong to someone else? A number of things were immediately apparent to the police. The victim had been dead at least 24 hours before the parts were found, and the dismembered body did not belong to a Thai man. The size of the pelvis was not natural for a Thai male, so they concluded it belonged to a foreigner. Unbeknownst to them at the time, the body parts belonged to Colombian plastic surgeon Edwin Arrieta Artiga. Edwin Arrieta Artiga was a 44-year-old plastic surgeon who was born and raised in Lorica, Colombia. Edwin was a dedicated plastic surgeon who was somewhat famous for his skill and hard work in his hometown of Lorica. Edwin had learned grit and hard work from his parents. His father was a man dedicated to his craft of fixing radios and television. His mother, a retired school teacher, loved by the people she taught. Edwin always knew he would be successful. He had to be. He was a product of parents who valued their work and gave themselves to it. And he was. The people who worked with him praised him for his skill and precision. In 2022, Edwin met a young man on Instagram. His name, Daniel Sancho Bronchalo. Daniel lived in Madrid, Spain, and was a chef who had a YouTube channel. He was also the son of famous Spanish actor Rodolfo Sancho Aguirre, most known for playing the father of a killer in the 2011 Spanish film, No Rest for the Wicked. Little did he know that life would imitate art a decade later. Daniel's mother is also a famous Spanish actor named Silvia Bronchalo. Together, they raised Daniel in Madrid, Spain. Daniel had a more than comfortable upbringing. Although his parents were very young when they had him, they provided for him and made sure he lacked nothing. Fast forward 28 years, Daniel met Edwin online and they immediately hit it off. But as their flirting progressed into a relationship, Daniel left out one tiny detail he wasn't single. Daniel had a girlfriend he had been dating for four years who lived in Indonesia. And when Daniel and Edwin celebrated a year together, they came into a problem. You see, Daniel decided to make things official with his girlfriend by proposing to her. She said yes, but he had one problem, Edwin. Edwin had the power to ruin him if he found out he had a girlfriend this whole time. Daniel knew he needed to handle breaking up with Edwin delicately. If Edwin even suspected Daniel had a woman on the side, he could tumble the whole house of cards. But how to do it without tipping Edwin off about his relationship, Daniel wondered. He decided to just approach it as a regular breakup. He'd tell Edwin he didn't want to pursue a relationship with him anymore without giving too much detail. And so Daniel broke up with Edwin. There was, again, one tiny problem. They had been happy in their relationship before the breakup. Edwin didn't buy it. He knew something else was going on, and he was determined to find out what it was, even if it killed. And unfortunately for Edwin, that would prove true in more ways than one. When Daniel told Edwin he wanted to break things off, he expected some resistance, but what he didn't expect was the outward rejection of his attempt at breaking up. Edwin wasn't buying it. He refused to accept Daniel's explanations and demanded to know the truth. Daniel eventually confessed the truth to Edwin in hopes that he would accept the breakup and move on, but his heart was shattered and he wanted to make Daniel pay. Edwin began to threaten Daniel he threatened to release photos of them together online so his parents would see who he truly was. Daniel was scared, his parents were famous, and him being gay, sadly, could destroy their careers. He knew he had to do something to make Daniel see reason, shut him up for good. Daniel came up with a plan. He suggested he and Edwin meet up in person to talk about their relationship. Edwin agreed, and their journeys brought them to Copanyan, where Daniel would meet a quick and brutal death. Edwin booked a room at a hotel in Copanyan from July 31st to August 3rd. They had also planned to attend the full moon party while they were there, except Edwin never got to see the day. You see, as much as Daniel was planning to convince Edwin not to expose him, he had another plan a more sinister plan. By 3.30 p.m., Edwin arrived at Copanyan, and Daniel was there to pick him up. They made their way to the hotel to relax after a long flight. After a few hours of relaxing, they went out to explore the gorgeous sights of Copanyan. They went to a restaurant and then went out to Rin Beach to enjoy the calm of the ocean. It was a good day spent together. Edwin was happy. He had his lover back, or so he thought. Little did he know the horrific plans Daniel had for him. In a truly disturbing move, 
Daniel had gone to a nearby store to purchase some items he would need. He bought rubber gloves so as not to leave any prints. He bought a saw to cut up the body. And lastly, he bought supplies to clean up after he was done. Back at the hotel, Daniel began to convince Edwin to agree to the breakup so he could go ahead to marry his girlfriend. Edwin again refused, but he not only refused, he proceeded to threaten to expose Daniel if he went ahead with the wedding. Daniel felt trapped. I am guilty, but I was Edwin's hostage. He held me hostage. It was a glass cage, but it was a cage. Daniel was seething and he couldn't take it anymore. He knew what he had to do. He said that if the talk wasn't successful, he thought he had to kill him because he had the partner waiting to get married. Daniel punched Edwin hard. Edwin staggered back, but quickly recovered and bit Daniel's hand. But then Daniel hit him over the head and again and again until he was no longer breathing. Edwin was gone and Daniel no longer had to live in fear of being exposed. So he went to work dismembering Edwin's body. He chopped up his head first, then went to work on the rest of the body. You see, being a chef, Daniel was pretty familiar with a knife. He chopped Edwin's body into 14 parts and started shoving them into a suitcase he brought with him. But there was a problem. Daniel had miscalculated. All of Edwin wasn't fitting into the suitcase. He had to quickly figure out how to dispose of the rest of him. You see, Daniel had initially planned to shove Edwin into a suitcase and dump him in the ocean. But his plan was failing terribly and Daniel had to think fast on his feet. He decided to put the rest of him in trash bags. Once he was done, he picked up the parts in the trash bags and threw them at a nearby garbage dump. Then his next plan involved renting a kayak and paddling the rest of Edwin out to sea. But there was another problem. The women he wanted to rent a kayak from, Tuk and Kanda, were refusing to rent him the kayak. They were concerned it was too late to venture out to sea and they didn't want any trouble if Daniel didn't return. Daniel was getting frantic. He had body parts in a suitcase in his hotel room and his plan was coming apart before his very eyes. He began to sweat on a cold night. The women noticed something was off, so they denied him. But then Daniel offered them something they couldn't refuse. Daniel offered to buy their kayak for $1,000. That's a lot of money, and the women couldn't turn it down. Daniel bought the kayak and headed out to Salat Beach to dispose of Edwin's body. When he got back, he was relieved. His plan was working, and he would never get caught. Daniel got to work scrubbing the hotel room of any trace of blood. He rinsed whatever part was scattered around the hotel room down the drain. When he was done, he took a shower and went out to the full moon party with two women he had met earlier, like nothing happened. When he got back from a night of partying, Daniel checked out of the hotel and checked into a different one. On August 3rd, 2023, after Edwin's body parts had been found at the garbage dump, the police did a DNA test and discovered their victim was Edwin Arietta Artiga. Further investigation led them to discover that Edwin had arrived at Copanyan on July 31st and had booked a room at a nearby hotel. As their investigation proceeded, they had a most unusual visit that set in motion some bizarre events. Two days after he bludgeoned his lover to death, Daniel walked into the Copanyan police station to report him missing. When he came into the police station, the police noticed a few things. Daniel was weirdly nervous, which was unusual since he only came in to report a missing person. Daniel also had scratches and bruises all over his body, fresh ones for that matter. Something was not adding up, so they detained him for questioning. Daniel told the police a few truths mixed with so many lies. He told them he had arrived before Edwin on July 31st, and he went to pick Edwin up on August 2nd. According to Daniel, they went out exploring, and Edwin went missing shortly after they got back. The police sensed there was more to the story, but they didn't have enough to hold him, so they let him go, but not before revoking his visa and seizing his passport so he couldn't leave. The police went on with their investigation and discovered more shocking details. They found a CCTV video of Daniel and Edwin on a bike on August 1st, which meant Daniel was lying when he said Edwin arrived on August 2nd. It also meant Daniel was the last person to see Edwin alive. The police discovered that Daniel had booked a separate hotel way before his arrival to Copanyan to make it look like he and Edwin weren't together, but there was more. They also found surveillance images of Daniel buying a bunch of bizarre things to conceal a body. It was clear Daniel had something to do with Edwin's murder, so they brought him in for further questioning. The jig was up. 
But Daniel's still stuck to his previous story. The more evidence the police showed him, the more stressed Daniel got. Daniel Sancho Branchalo tried to cover up the crime by laying about where he stayed. He double booked his accommodation and had it all planned. As he earlier bought items such as knives, rubbish bags, and cleaning products. After hours of questioning, Daniel confessed to the most horrific crime. Daniel was subsequently arrested and charged with premeditated murder. He was forced by the police to take them to places where he had dumped Edwin's body so they could recover the rest of his parts. Daniel was arraigned to court on August 7th, 2023, and is expected to face the death penalty. <laughs> 